If they were to hold a managerial clinic and just have the managers there, I would say Gene Mock should run the clinic. He was a visionary as a manager. He was an innovator as a manager. He invented being at the ballpark at 11 o'clock or noon and studying tape, studying information, preparing for games. He sat and studied. He was looking for a loophole like a tax man would look for a loophole in the tax laws. He analyzed you right away. He wanted to know everything about you. In my office, when my players walked by coming in on their street shoes and when they walked out, going out in their baseball, I could tell you every one of them by just seeing from the knees down how they tied their shoes, I could tell you every one of them. His intensity was beyond comprehension. After a tough game and he lost, you just didn't want to be anywhere near him or have, have any part of him. He was very, very, very intense. Once in a while, he'd come in and he'd be gone. He wouldn't shower. If he didn't get down quick enough from the press box, the uniform would be in the middle of the room like it was smoldering. You know, you could almost see the charcoal underneath it. He would turn over spare ribs and buffet tables and nearly cut his finger off throwing a, a stool, a metal stool across the room, you know, just because somebody happened to giggle at the wrong time. It was just like uh, the Tasmanian devil came in the clubhouse. <laughs> <laughs> One time, Jerry Grody came over to reach in for a foul ball. It was going to end the game. Mark punched him in the stomach to make him drop the ball. <laughs> he looked like an old uh, teacher you had in high school you couldn't stand would always get on you, give you detention, give you more homework than the other kids. He was just like that old grouch over there. I hated him playing against him. He'd be yelling at me all the time and, uh, and loved playing for him. The only person that I wanted to get a base hit for was Gene Mock. In April of 1960, the 34-year-old Mock was hired as manager of the Phillies, one of the worst teams in the majors. The dimension of how bad the Phillies were it was a 23 game losing streak. I mean, that's almost a month without a win. 23 games. The one thing about Gene Mock sticks in my mind. He says, who are you? And I said, I came here to ask you, how is it possible to lose that many games in a row? And he looked at me and he put those two lasers, beams that he has, that he used for eyes when he was intense. And they burned holes right here, no, probably up here. And steam was coming out of his ears. He said, I don't know how I ever survived it. And he said, but I don't intend to ever go through it again. After back-to-back -back cellar finishes that included 96 more losses than wins, the Phillies began to slowly improve. But in 1963, the frustration of mediocrity boiled over in Houston. Well, it happened a little uh, slightly built guy come up and pinch hit in the ninth inning. Joe Morgan, you're talking about one of the best players, you know, in the game of baseball and Hall of Famer, of course. And he fired a base hit in the right field and beat us. I told my roommate, Bobby Wine, I says, don't be in too big of a hurry to get in the clubhouse. He says, why? I said, well, I said did you see Gene's juggler vein? I said, it's just protruding, boy. It's just jumping up and down. The clubhouse guy on the visiting team used to put a big spread out. All of a sudden, here comes Gene Mark and kicked that table so hard. And there was food all over the place in everybody's locker. I had found a spare rib in my shoes and there was sauce all over, ceiling, floors, bathroom. Never saw anything like it in my life. By 1964, Mock's intensity had lifted the Phillies from the bottom of the league all the way to the top. Let's go, man. Come on, let's go to work. The Phillies for 150 games that year played the best baseball I have ever seen played by any team anywhere. Every time they had to move a runner, they moved it. Every bunt was executed perfectly. Please play, Ruben. Beautiful. Every time they had to hit the ball behind a runner at second base into right field, they did it. All the little things, they did it. Come on, Bill! He won games in April and May and June that he shouldn't have won. He would bring in his stopper in the second or third or fourth inning. When he needed a rally stopped, he would bring in his short man. I had never seen a manager do that. Mock was very hands-on in that way. He was gonna play 
every game as if it was the seventh game of the World Series. The 1964 Phillies had talent, luck, and intensity. Third baseman Richie Allen hit 29 homers and won Rookie of the Year honors. Right fielder Johnny Callison drove in over 100 runs, and Chris Short won 17, while 19-game winner Jim Bunning put on an unforgettable show at Shea Stadium. Perfect game against the Mets. Gene Mock in that game, he just got out of the way. He made defensive changes and then just disappeared, let the game go. Now, I don't know any other manager would do that. By mid-September, Philadelphia was primed for celebration. World Series tickets were being sold. The Phillies led by six and a half games with just 12 to play. And now we're playing the Cincinnati Reds at home. Frank Robinson was a batter. A guy named Chico Ruiz, an infielder, was on third base. And he stole home plate and beat us one to nothing. What is he doing? That was my first thought. What is going on here? I can still see Chico Ruiz running to home plate on that play. With that stolen base, Ruiz knocked the breath out of the Phillies. They lost three straight to Cincinnati, then four more to Milwaukee. Seven days, seven losses. Gene came into this place where we used to go after the 11 o'clock show. And he said, I told the guys all to go out tonight and do whatever they want. Get loose. And he sat there and he said, I can't understand it. I don't know what's going on, but we'll come out of it. And it was like watching an accident happen. It was just awful. Obviously, people kept talking about the pitching situation. He pitched those pitches on short rest. Twice during the last two weeks of the season, Mock pitched Bunning and Short on two days rest. Philadelphia lost all four games. Mock was vilified. He had to be inside the clubhouse and know that no one would take the ball. He did it out of necessity. Mock made a deal with the devil. He got him that far and then couldn't take him any farther. The deal with the devil was now having to be paid off. Mock's final payments to the devil were made in St. Louis, where the Phillies were swept by the surging Cardinals, extending the streak to 10. Despite finishing the season with two wins, the Phillies finished one game behind St. Louis. When we got to Philadelphia Airport and they opened that door from the plane, there was almost 5,000 people waiting for the ball club. Gene Mock got up and said, I don't want anybody to get off the plane before me were down the stairs in that plane and said to everybody there, don't blame them, blame me. I lost it, they didn't. I turned on the World Series and I said, no, I don't wanna watch this and turned it off because I should have been starting those games rather than Gibson. I walked in there and I watched the pregame stuff and then they played the national anthem and I couldn't take it. I turned around and walked out. I kind of took a little bit of satisfaction out of the fact that the boy genius had blown the pennant. You know, though maybe his reputation was somewhat inflated. In 1964, for 150 games, he was the best manager anyone had ever seen. That team had no right to be six and a half ahead with 12 to play, nor did it have a right to finish not winning the pennant. In both instances, Gene Mock was going to get the credit or the blame. I think Mock was to blame for 64 because he panicked. He only had to protect a lead, and pretty much everybody had conceded the pennant to him by that time, but he turned it into a race and, and lost it. Maybe I overdid it. I might have overdid it. I don't really know. I did everything the way I did everything during my life. I did everything by the seat of my pants. If I thought this was the thing to do, I did it. If you blame Mock, as many people in Philadelphia do, then you have to credit him with being in a position to blow it. Because if Dean Mock wasn't the manager of the 64 Phillies, I'm absolutely 100% positive there wouldn't have been any tenant to blow. A few of the unused World Series tickets my mother took and used them for uh, wallpaper in a powder room that she had in the basement of our house. So that kind of aptly described <laughs> the way the season ended for the Phillies. In 1981, when the Angels named 55-year-old Gene Mock as their new manager, he appeared at first to have softened. This is not the Gene Mock that was managing the Phillies, um, or even Minnesota. This is the 
relaxed version of Gene Mock. It lasted probably a mm, week or so. <laughs> Gene was a very tightly wound uh, individual. I think if, if you're around Gene Mock for 10 seconds, you know you're in the presence of someone who doesn't suffer fools. You would ask Mock a question, and it was like asking God. And there'd be a pause, and, and the feeling was, uh-oh. Did I ask the wrong question? Is he going to bite my head off? You could see him. He would get in this pose and kind of tuck his chin down like this, pull his heart down. You could just see him fuming. Didn't happen that often because, you know, we had a great team. We had four former MVPs on the same team. That was the 82 team uh, we had uh, in California, um, a star-studded team. Uh, we had all-stars at every position except for pretty much on the mound. That was the worst thing about the team. We had no bullpen that we could trust. You know? I mean, we'd be in the seventh inning with a four-run lead. We'd come back in and say, hey, we don't have enough runs. Let's go. And it was a tough season at the end. But, I mean, we battled back, and we played, and we won. And the Angels have won the West. You don't have to be told what's going on. Just look at the pictures and enjoy. The Angels have won the Western Division of the American League, and finally, they are able to celebrate. And then somewhere down the line, I'm kind of happy for the manager, too. I'm all playing for that manager. The monkey is off the back. The only thing that's been on my back is a bunch of heavy typewriters. <laughs> With his first big league title, Mott took his Angels into the 1982 American League Championship Series against Milwaukee. We blew them out the first two games. And we go to Milwaukee, uh, only needed to win one. But then the Philadelphia story of 18 years earlier roared into the present. Mock again used two pitchers on short rest. After Tommy John lost game four, Bruce Keeson started game five. 11.30 in the morning, sitting in the visiting dugout with only some members of the ground crew out in the field. It was a four o'clock game. Gene Mark turned to me and said, okay, this is the situation. Sanchez starts having control problems. Now the bases are loaded. Cecil Cooper's at the plate. I've got Andy Hassler in the bullpen, and Sanchez is struggling with his control. You know Hassler, what would you do? I said, well, I'm always worried about Andy Hassler, hitting the guy, throwing the ball to the bat, something, or a guy hitting it back to the mound and having him throw it into center field. He looked at me and he said, it's exactly what I think, at least Sanchez will throw the ball over the plate. In the seventh inning of game five, Mock's foresight became reality. With the left-handed hitting Cooper at the plate and the Angels leading 3-2, right-hander Luis Sanchez stayed in the game, while left-hander Andy Hassler stayed in the bullpen. Left field, base hit, tied run. Moores comes to score. Gantner on his way to the plate. Throw through, Brewers lead. The headlines the next day was uh, Gene Mock was placed on this earth to suffer. It really hit him, and he was devastated by that loss. I don't think Gene had his job uh, on the flight back. I think he lost his job on the flight back to California. But Mock could not change into a business suit, and by 1985, he was back where he belonged. There was only one place where I was ever really, really comfortable, and that's when I had the uniform on and I was at the ballpark. The only place in the world, not on the first tee, not on the 18th green, only in the dugout, in the clubhouse with the uniform on. 